of us are slaves in the wake of sin. Yes, there is sin, S-I-N. We'll talk about that and more. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. As we go through the Bible, we are learning much. We are in the book of Lamentation today, written by Jeremiah, the great prophet. And Corey is here. Corey, what's up? Well, we are going to be taking a look at King Jehoiachin and his exile in Babylon as confirmed by records from Babylon itself. All right, very good. Look forward to that. And what'd you do, Jan? Today, we're going to take a look at Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21. Very good. Lamentations is a great book. Anyway, Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm exploring a strange and mysterious phenomenon of historical anniversaries that's governed the life of God's chosen people. All right, very good. Get your Bible guide and your Bible out. It is time to study the Book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink and our wood comes at a price. They pursue at our heels. We labor and have no rest. We have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven because of the fever of famine. They ravished the women in Zion, the maidens in the cities of Judah. Princes were hung up by their hands, and elders were not respected. Young men ground at the millstones, boys staggered under loads of wood. The elders have ceased gathering at the gate, and the young men from their music. Lamentations chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. in a good future is pointless without Jesus Christ. There are some who believe that human nature will do its best and it'll get better over time, but the opposite is actually true. You see, something had to be done for human nature and the sin that has infected us. And someone did, Jesus Christ. It is through God's salvation plan in Jesus Christ that everything inside of us is changed. And we are given hope and we are given a future. Now the book of Lamentations written by Jeremiah reminds us that our hope is never found in ourselves or humanly, but is dependent upon God that is the God of the Bible. And as we read God's word, we learn what God is like and who he really is. This is why we seek to know and meditate on the scripture and forge it into our hearts. We are trying to learn about God. We're trying to learn about the Lord. We're trying to understand the big picture and a big plan in our life. And as Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations, he is expressing his great disappointment and his great terror and horror that Jerusalem is destroyed. Imagine this prophet, the prophet of God who lived in these times, seeing the demise of the great city of Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the hope of man. And as we, as we do, we're going to talk about lamentations because the hope of man is not in man, but the hope of man is in God. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have one, you can write for yours. You can use the phone number and call us. We'll get it quickly and send it to you. Or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, there is a 24-7 live stream that you can stream all about 
Bible programming and everything else, it's right there. But also make a donation. You can go click donation and it'll take you to the PDF file after you've made the donation. And we very much appreciate that. Thank you so much for doing that. Father, I pray today as we study the hope for man, as we look at man's ideas of the future and see God's ideas for the future, there's going to be a change. And help us to articulate that in our spirit. Help us to read from your scripture and make it true in us in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen. Now look at the scripture. This gets really good. We're talking about a depressing uh, part of the lamentations. Now listen carefully. It says, remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens and our houses to foreigners. We have become orphans and wafts and our mothers like widows. We pay for the water we drink and our wood comes at a price. They pursue our heels. We labor and have no rest. We've given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. That's amazing. We learn that we are slaves in the wake of sin. Beloved, when we have a sinful nature that carries on for three, four, five generations, we're slaves to that wake of sin. God frees us when we learn to accept him with all our heart. This is why we always say on this program, and we tell people, come to Jesus Christ. Make yourself to him submissive. And today, nobody wants to be submissive, but we should submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved. He is the one that has the plan for us. And that's what we learn here. Very important. Now, let's go on to the scripture. It continues in verses 7 through 9. Our fathers sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Man, that's incredible. And here's something else we learn. We can lose righteousness as time goes on. Righteousness is rightness with God. We can lose that as time goes on because our minds are cursed under sin. Every generation has a choice to make about who God is. Now, let me ask you a question. If you are young, and you're making fun of me or going on making fun of the Bible or, or just curious, let me tell you something. You have a decision to make about God, the God of everything, the God of earth, the God of the universe. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about the God of you. He made you. You know, you, you were not some cosmic accident. You didn't just happen on the earth. You're not an accident. God designed every cell in your body and you have to make a decision whether you believe that or not, whether you understand that. You must decide what you believe about God. And that's important. Every generation has to decide that. The last generation made a decision. The generation before that made a decision. And now this generation must make that decision. Who is God to us? Who is God to you? Well, I choose God as the God of everything. The God of the universe who helps me and and teaches me things that I do not know and helps me to do the right thing, to act but react like a Christian, like a believer. That's somebody that we need to look to and say, Lord, help me because of his Holy Spirit. Very important. Now let's go on to the last passage. Our skin is as hot as an oven because of the fever of famine. They ravish the women in Zion and the maidens in the cities of Judah. Princes were hung up by their hands, and elders were not respected. Young men ground at the millstones, and boys staggered under the loads of wood. The elders have, have ceased gathering at the gate, and the young men from their music. These are depressing ideas and thoughts from Lamentations. We lose our order and civility as we move forward without God, because we move forward in sin. See, without God, we do not grow naturally. We don't grow. Instead, we move backwards. If we want to grow, we have to 
connect with God, the God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And we have to say, Jesus Christ, you are real. We must make that decision. Maybe you today want to make that decision. Maybe you today are ready to decide to come to Jesus Christ. Can I lead you in prayer? I'm going to anyway. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would help us now. And we say, say this out loud, say, Jesus, come into my life. I need you today to be the Lord of my life. I believe that you died on the cross. You were killed. We killed you 2,000 years ago. And suddenly, after three days, you rose from the dead. Nobody's ever done that, Lord. I believe you did that. Because my sin had to be paid for. When you were on the cross, you saw me. And Father, I come to you today and ask you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to make yourself known to me. Help me to learn who you are. And as I come to you, and there's a lot of things in my life that aren't right, but help my life to be turned around. Help the evil to be gone. And it's going to take some time. But Lord, as I walk in your direction, Help me to follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray these things. And we all said together, amen. Now, if you're someone who has prayed that, write to us. Write a letter and say, I prayed that. And we'll send you some information. But it's important that you understand that we learn the Bible because we're learning about God. We learn the Bible because we're learning about Jesus Christ. And we are understanding what God decides for us to do and how to live today. As we conclude reading through and studying the ancient book of Lamentations written by the prophet Jeremiah, I want to take some time to look at a king that Jeremiah actually references in the end of his first book, the book of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah mentions that Jehoiachin, who was king for only about three months and was taken captive to Babylon, he mentions his treatment in Babylon. So we're going to be taking a look at that right now and some extra extra biblical evidence from Babylon itself that this actually occurred. Take a look. The last five kings of Jerusalem ruled during the uncertain times of the 7th and 6th centuries BC. The empire of Assyria along with her ally Egypt were failing and falling to the ever-growing power of the new Babylonian empire, led by her kings Nebuchadnezzar and his general son Nebuchadnezzar. By the time Jehoiachin of Jerusalem had risen to the throne, Judah was in a bad state. Forced to become vassals of Babylon years earlier, Jehoiachin's father had rebelled against the empire, inviting open war to the borders of Judah. The Babylonian army advanced and succeeded, defeating Jehoiachin's father Jehoiakim and allowing Jehoiachin to rule on the throne for a mere three months and ten days before deporting him to Babylon the same deportation that took the prophet Ezekiel to Babylon and the valuable utensils from the Jerusalem temple. This portion of history is known both from the Bible and the records of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. A cuneiform tablet from Nebuchadnezzar's excavated palace was found and translated in 1955, saying, in the seventh year, the king assembled his army. He encamped over against the city of the Judeans and conquered it. He took the king prisoner and appointed in his stead a king after his own heart. Forced to live in Babylon as a prisoner king, a trophy of sorts to Babylon's greatness, Jehoiachin oddly shows up twice more in the scripture's records. There is an account of his good treatment, the daily rations given to him, and even an eventual release from prison to live as some sort of official in the royal courts of Nebuchadnezzar's son. Verification of this good treatment was also discovered in Nebuchadnezzar's excavated palace. 
In a stash of administrative documents, one was translated that named the captive King of the Land of Judah, Jehoiachin, and then listed the specific amounts of food given to him daily as ordered by the King of Babylon. So there we have this, this correlation between the Bible and physical history. So, so this artifact that has been left over, this record that has survived thousands of years from Babylon about this same individual, this, this Jehoiachin, this Prince of Judah, this descendant of David, who was treated very well in the courts of Babylon. Now, this is not uh, extremely unusual in terms of uh, captives being able to live well uh, in captivity, but there must have been something unique about the relationship that Jehoiachin had with the Babylonian courts because it's mentioned in the Bible a couple times here in Jeremiah and also back in the records of the Kings and Chronicles. So the fact that we have this artifact that physically, you know, actually mentions his name and his provisions is very cool. It's one of those connections that uh, can't be denied. So it's just a fun, a fun fact as we're reading through the Bible. Uh, to add that in there and have that knowledge in our repertoire. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. Ryan, what do you have for us? Thanks, Corey. Well, today I want to take a historical journey and explore eight major events which drastically affected the nation of Israel. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah was an eyewitness to one of these events, and we read his lamentation in today's assigned reading. But what's interesting about these eight events is that they were all tragedies. But even more than that is the fact that no matter what year the event occurred in, it always happened on the same day of the year, the 9th of Av. Could it be mere coincidence that eight tragic events directly affecting the nation of Israel would occur on the same day? Well, you be the judge. Many proclaim that history belongs to God. History is his story. But does an examination of said history provide evidence for that claim? For many, and particularly the Jews, God can be the only reasonable explanation. That's because a strange and mysterious phenomenon of historical anniversaries has governed the life of the chosen people. Numerous key historical events, in fact, in relation to the nation of Israel, have coincided exactly with particular Jewish festival or fast days which had been previously established by God. Perhaps the strangest of these historical anniversaries is the 9th of Av a single day on the Jewish calendar on which a series of at least eight national disasters have occurred. Even today, the 9th of Av is a national feast of mourning for the Jews, known as Tisha B'Av. The first in these series of unfortunate events occurred in 1446 BC. The Israelites are in the desert, recently having experienced the miraculous exodus, and are now poised to enter the Promised Land. But first, they dispatch a reconnaissance mission to assist in formulating a prudent battle strategy. Unfortunately, 10 out of the 12 spies return with a bad report, claiming that the land is unconquerable. For this public demonstration of distrust in his power, God turns their short 40-day reconnaissance mission into a 40 years of wilderness wandering, effectively preventing anyone from that generation, except the two faithful spies, from entering that land. A second tragedy occurred in 589 BC when the Babylonians destroyed the first Jewish temple built by King Solomon. Similarly, just as the Babylonians had destroyed their first temple, the Romans five centuries later would destroy their second temple. The date? The 9th of Av, 70 AD, an event foretold nearly 40 years earlier by Jesus Christ. Then, exactly one year later, the Roman army plowed with salt the site of the Temple Mount and the whole city as a symbol of Rome's utter defeat of its enemy. A few years after that, when the Jews rebelled against Rome, they believed that their leader, Simon Bar Kokhba, would fulfill their messianic longings. But their hopes were cruelly dashed in AD 133, as the Jewish rebels were brutally butchered in the final battle at Batar, again on the 9th of Av. Over a thousand years later, tragedy would strike yet again, as the ruthless English king Edward I ordered the expulsion of all Jews from the nation in 1290. Following suit just a couple hundred years later, the Spanish government also ordered the expulsion of the Jews. Finally, on the 9th of Av in August 1914, 
as the Jews fasted and mourned, World War I was declared. Statistically speaking, it is virtually impossible that these eight specific events would all fall on the very day of the Feast of Mourning by simple happenstance. The only rational explanation is that God indeed is in control of history and is greatly involved with the nation of Israel. Furthermore, this same God will return to his people as their Messiah to set up his long-awaited kingdom, and the fasts and mourning will be turned into feasts of joy. Now, just in case you're still in doubt that God was involved here, let's just for a moment consider the statistics. Let's do the math. So a tragic event occurs on the 9th of Av. Then a second tragic event occurs on the same day of a different year. Well, how do we calculate the odds? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Since there's 365 days in a year, the chance that a second significant historical tragedy could occur by random chance alone on the very same anniversary date of a previous tragedy, say the 9th of Av, is 1 times 365, or 1 chance in 365. The odds against a third similar historical event occurring to the same nation on the exact same day, the 9th day of Av, is 1 times 365 times 365 which is equal to one chance in 133,225. Now skipping ahead for the sake of time, the odds that all eight historical events would occur by random chance alone on the 9th of Av, rather than by God's pro providential design, is one chance in 873 quadrillion. And that's 873 with 15 zeros behind it. So the idea that these events all occurred by random chance is really absurd and mathematically impossible. History truly is his story, and it's not over yet. Remember, God's going to return to his people as their Messiah to set up his long-awaited kingdom, and the fasts and mourning will be turned into feasts of joy for all of us. I find that interesting, and, and it's important for people to realize that a lot of people talked about how that, uh, you know, 9-11 was a, an event, and so every 9-11, they're really, they, they look at every... 11th day of September, they're really excited because they look and they say, wait, you know, everybody's calm and all that. And they say because they like to do it on dates. But mm -hmm. you, you see something like this and you say, wait a minute, for, for that to happen, for these chances, for these things to happen on those dates, yeah. one in, in a quadrillion? It's more than that. I, I mean, yeah, what in the world yeah, are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, you it's, lost me mathematically, like right near the yeah, beginning. And, and, and that's <laughs> the point. That's the kind of the point I yes. wanted to get at here. Yeah. Is that it's you? If if you know what? If I lost you, then yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the point. It's mathematically impossible. God's hand is all over uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, and like I said, it's the the mourning and sorrow is going to turn into joy. So, uh, yeah, and you, you know, know what's, what's unfortunate is there have been people who worship numbers. And uh, we're not worshiping mm, numbers no. or any of that. But, but the fact is that Jesus Christ and the Lord, God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, he is, he, he understands time and he's got it down. He knows exactly what's going on and he does things in time. And I think that's very important to remember. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that. So, uh, the 9th of Ave. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's absolutely stunning and amazing. Okay, well, that's good. Thank you for that report. We appreciate it. Janice. Lamentations chapter 5. It's a prayer for restoration, and uh, it opens up, Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Look and behold our reproach. And Jeremiah goes into this prayer of, uh, of restoration, and it brings us down to a look at Lamentations 5, verse 21. It says, um, here, turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. And I just thought, only if the Lord restored the people would they enjoy life as it used to be. And such restoration is God's to give in response to repentance. And that's the turning away from sin and faith which is trust in God. So for today, we still have that same restoration available. Remember what we talked about yesterday in Lamentations 3. Great is God's faithfulness. We're not consumed because of his mercies. They fail not. They're new every, every morning. Great is his faithfulness. But we have that same restoration available to each one of us today. 
that same restoration mm. that Jeremiah prayed for because it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. This is an amazing prayer. Here it is in the, this is the ESV version of the Bible. And uh, it said that the same verse says, mm -hmm. well, it starts off in verse 20. It says, why do you forget us forever? Why do you forsake us for so many days? And then it turns and it says, restore us to yourself. Restore us mm -hmm. to yourself, O oh Lord, yeah. that we may be restored. Mm -hmm. So we can't do it. We have to ask God to do it. That's right. And I think that's important because the Bible teaches that in the Old Testament, <laughs> in the book of Lamentations, which is lamenting the fall of Jerusalem. So anyway, he says here, uh, restore us, renew our days as of old. In other words, make us like we were when we were doing it right. When we were following you. When we were following your covenant, yeah. when we were doing it right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we, you know, so many times people, they, you know, they, they lose their zeal. You know, when you're first saved, you're just crazy. You know, you're going to cast the demons out of a dirt devil vacuum cleaner, you know, all that stuff. But then as time goes on, you just sort of lose that hype. Mm -hmm. And then you just finally, you get over here. This is restore us back to where we were. You know, we, we don't need to be casting demons out of, you know, vacuum cleaners. But at the same time, we need the intensity of God. It says, unless you have utterly rejected us, which he hasn't, and you remain exactly or are exceedingly angry with us, which he doesn't, because God's anger is interesting and his anger is slow, but his anger also comes to the place of restoration. And we need to remember that today there are more people in Israel than there ever have been in the history of time. Think that through and let's see what God is going to do.